management is reconnected thank you and over to you thank you faizan good afternoon everyone apologies uh, for the delayed start thank you for joining us for the discussion on our results for the year ended march 31st 2022 our results including the investor presentation press release and regulatory disclosures are already available on our website as well as that of the stock exchanges i have with me suresh badami executive director neeraj shah cfo srinivasan parthati chief actuary ishwari murugan our appointed actuary and kunal jain from investor relations as you know we listed our company in fy18 and we thought it would be good for us to share our performance over the past 4 years we are proud to share that we have at least doubled our new business premium renewal premium protection ape assets under management value of new business and embedded value further details can be found on slide 5 of our investor presentation i will take you through the key highlights of our fy22 results and would be happy to take questions post that we clocked a growth of 16% in individual wrp in fy22 with the market share of 14.8% and 9.3% in the private and overall sector respectively despite very trying times during the two year pandemic our two year cagr of 17% was almost two times industry growth of 9% demand remain robust across most channels and segments and hence we continue to be optimistic about the growth prospects for the life insurance sector in the coming years we are closely tracking the worrisome geopolitical situation and its potential impact on inflation and consumption trends in our view life stage products such as annuity and protection are relatively insulated from such external factors with the severity of covid infections having waned we have returned to normalized mortality experience however we remain watchful and we'll continue to keep an eye on the emerging situation moving on to our business update we continue to maintain a balanced and profitable product mix with non par savings at 33% participating products at 30% ulips at 26% individual protection at 6% and annuity at 5% based on individual ape almost a fifth of our non par savings business in receipt premium terms post the launch of sanchay fmp in the second half of the year consisted of single pay products and these are relatively simpler to hedge this gives us the ability to allow for a higher proportion of non par savings in our business overall protection grew by 24% in terms of ape and 47% in terms of new business premium this was largely led by a 55% growth in credit life new business premium on the back of higher disbursements on the individual side demand continues to be healthy in terms of number of applications logged in however proportion of policies actually issued still remains a constraining factor at our end on account of tighter sourcing guidelines lack of a centralized medical database and underwriting challenges in tier 2 3 locations with a combination of data analytics insights into customer profiles and calibrated risk retention we expect to be able to grow individual protection in fy23 some of the initiatives taken by us in this space include development of an in-house automated underwriting engine platform for scheduling medicals in real time facilitating video medicals and integrating technology to measure heart rate bmi and other vitals using video input from the customer's mobile on the retirement side our annuity business recorded 24% growth with a v industry growth of 3% annuities now contribute over a fifth of our new business premium we have been able to almost double our business in the last 3 years we believe that protection and retirement solutions are multi decade opportunities and will continue to grow faster than other segments we covered 54 million lives in fy22 registering an increase of 36% over fy21 we settled close to 3.9 lakh claims during fy22 gross and net claims were at rupees 5804 crores and rupees 4328 crores respectively for fy22 the reserves created during the year have been more than adequate to address increased mortality on account of covid as on 31st march 22 we carry reserves of rupees 55 crores into fy23 as a prudent measure towards covid moving on to key operating and financial metrics 
our renewal premium recorded a steady growth of 18% with our 13 month persistency ending at 92% up from 90% in the previous year and our 61st month persistency ending at 58% up from 53% in the previous year further 13th and 61st month persistency for limited and regular pay policies was at 87% and 54% respectively up from 85% and 49% in the previous year new business margin for fy22 was 27.4% versus 26.1% for fy21 on the back of our robust growth and margin expansion we delivered a value of new business for fy22 of rupees 2675 crore 22% higher than fy21 our value of new business has grown at a 24% cagr over the past 5 years and has almost tripled in the last 5 years our embedded value as at march 31 2022 was rupees 30048 crores so 30048 crores we have been able to almost double our embedded value in the last 4 years operating return on embedded value after factoring excess mortality reserve or emr Uh, which was created during FY22 was at 16.6 percent, excluding EMR. Operating return on embedded value would have been 19 percent, as against 18.5 percent for FY21. Profit after tax for FY22 was rupees 1,208 crore, a decline of 11 percent versus FY21 due to higher mortality reserve created during the year. post wave 2 our profit after tax in q3 and q4 improved steadily with profit after tax for q4 registering a 12% yoy growth the board has recommended a dividend of rupees 1.70 per share translating to a payout of 30% of our profit after tax in line with our dividend payout ratio of of fy21 and earlier solvency as on march 31 2022 stood at 176% post the cash payout of 726 crore to exide industries as part consideration for the acquisition of exide life excluding impact of this cash payout solvency ratio would have been 189% our board has approved a sub debt raise of rupees 350 crores which should increase solvency by around 600 basis points in order to further strengthen solvency to fuel growth we will continue evaluating raising capital through a mix of equity and debt next on channel performance all channels continue to perform well with bank assurance growing by 13% this year and 21% based on two year cagr proprietary distribution which includes our agency direct and online channels grew by 18% this year and 11% based on two year cagr on individual ape basis over the last 5 years our share of proprietary distribution increased to 33% from 23% our agency channel grew by 26% the channel added more than 40000 agents in fy22 which is the second highest amongst private players our agency life initiative aimed at capability development continues to see healthy participation Moreover we are focused on building a women financial consultant model which we believe would give us higher activation retention and productivity Moving on to product innovation and sustainability we continued with our efforts to stay relevant to customers needs offer new propositions and provide a seamless and pleasant customer experience During the year we launched non-pass savings plan Sunshine Six Maturity plan which now contributes more than 15% of our non-pass savings mix we also rolled out our retirement product systematic retirement plan which is a regular pay deferred annuity further we introduced a bundle solution quick protect which combines our click to protect protection plan and riders to offer cover against the three d's death disease and disability On the ESG front, front we have signed up for the UN Supported Principles of Responsible Investment (PRI), joining a network of more than 4,800 organizations around the world that have publicly demonstrated their commitment to responsible investment. Now, an update on our subsidies. Our pension subsidy (HKC pension) ended FY22 with a AUM of rupees 28,414 crore, an uptick of 73% versus previous year. Additionally as per 
National Pension Scheme Fund Performance Report published in March 22, we continued to rank number one in terms of fund performance across categories. As on 31st March 2022, HFC Pension had a market share of 37%, retaining its number one position as private pension fund manager in terms of NPS AUM. NPS continues to contribute significantly to our annuity business. Our wholly owned subsidiary HFC International Life and Re generated gross return premiums of USD 15.64 million, registering 18% year on year growth. Our third subsidiary, Excite Life, recorded a healthy growth of 22% based on individual WRP in FY22, well above the industry overall growth of 16%. Its embedded value as on March 31, 2022 was 2,910 crores. The merger process has been initiated with NCLT and is expected to be completed in the second half of this financial year. We continue to make progress in being able to seamlessly integrate both the businesses post-regulatory approval. We are confident about continued margin expansion on a standalone basis at HFC Life and Excite Life and aspire to be margin neutral on a consolidated basis in FY23. However, we will prioritize value preservation and investment in expanding the franchise. On the regulatory front, a new IRDI chairman, Sri Debashish Panda, unveiled his vision of independent India being an insured India as we celebrate Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav on our 75 years of independence. He mentioned a revamping regulatory framework to align with international benchmarks, B, outcomes and tech-based supervision, C, simplifying regulatory processes, D, moving towards product certification by insurers as the principles laid down by IRDAI, and E, supportive of tech-led initiatives. These initiatives would help provide impetus to ease of doing business. Further, uh, the chairman has laid out a roadmap on how insurers would help drive the above with eight thematic groups already having been constituted and having kick-started work. With these path-breaking initiatives, we are very optimistic of the prospects of our sector. To conclude, our objective remains to bring more individuals under the financial safety net by offering multiple innovative solutions, increasing customer connect, and continuing to expand our offline and online distribution. The detailed disclosure on our results is available in our investor presentation. Wishing everyone success as we embark on a new financial year. We're happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Suresh Ganpati from Macquarie. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Vibha. Congratulations uh, on your good four-year performance. Um, just three quick questions. One is on the 80 basis point uh, change in operating assumptions impacting uh, margin. Um, what exactly is that? Yeah, so, Suresh, this is basically the strength and reality assumptions that we had uh, at the beginning of the period, given uh, how, what we're seeing in the uh, portfolio. So, that's, that's something that was put through at the beginning of the period itself, and that's uh, getting reflected both in uh, the embedded value walk as well as in our uh, VNB walk uh, in the investor deck. Sorry, the mortality assumptions you are saying, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. Now, this is a recurring feature because I don't know, I mean, this can again recur next year. I mean, are you confident that this is done and dusted, or do you feel like this can evolve? 
So, Suresh, uh, I mean, uh, the good thing is that uh, it is done up front uh, and it's, it's not something that is, you know, left for later. Uh, as you see that uh, mortality experience evolves, uh, this is something that we would uh, continue to, you know, uh, uh, put through in our embedded value to take whatever uh, charge that we need to take. But uh, it's, it's uh, something that is not expected to be a routine uh, uh, element. Uh, as you know, the protection journey is fairly recent in India, right? Uh, over the last uh, few years, uh, we now have slowly started expanding from the top 10 cities and uh, from the salaried segment into uh, tier 2, tier 3, and uh, uh, to beyond uh, the, the salary into self-employed and professionals. So as that happens, the mortality experience will evolve, and uh, that is something that will uh, you know, uh, change mortality experience as we go forward, and that will get reflected in new pricing as well. Okay. Uh, two general questions, Vibha. One is on um, the merger with HCFC uh, Limited and Bank, the merger. How does it change the equation in the sense that do you see more opportunities on anything which you were not doing earlier, you can do it more or any challenges? Uh, that's, the, that's the first generic question. And the second question is... Um, how do you see the LIC's IPO changing the equation in the sense, have you seen them on the ground getting uh, more aggressive on the non-pass segment? Are they launching new products? How the competitive environment will change? And, you know, any perspective on that would be great. Yeah. Right. Yeah, very valid. Uh, on the first one, um, uh, you know, while HFC Bank was always part of the group, uh, now uh, with this merger going through, uh, we will become a subsidiary of HFC Bank or at least, uh, you know, uh, eventually I want this post-regulatory approval. So there will be a direct alignment. That is number one. Number two is that cross-sell opportunities. I think every group is looking at, uh, every major business group is looking at cross-sell op opportunities uh, in a very... Um, a structured manner, uh, which I'm somewhat um, probably um, you know, the, the focus has not been there so far because there was enough that was happening in, a, in our respective individual companies. So, um, so that is number two. And with the use of digital and with data protection, we will see as to uh, someone who is anyway well disposed towards buying from HDFC group of companies that. Uh, whatever you need in terms of one-stop shop, you can get it from there. So more was of that lim will Was limited selling credit protect policies of life in a big way? Yes. Yes, they were. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They were selling it, but, um, uh, you, you know, we would not probably have a lot of upsell or cross-sell to them in terms of other products. So there would be a loan taken, there would be a coverage of the loan, and then uh, loan is repaid, cover is closed. Um, so these are all affording customers. So um, and we are known as a product innovator. So for us to keep going back to say, have you thought of this? You know, for example, um, deferred and not known maybe four years ago, or non-par was we were the ones to launch non-par the way it is uh, understood as a category today, and so on. And we'll continue with more. So that that kind of an upsell crosssell, more of that can happen. Also, product innovation in terms of uh, solutioning, whether it is a, a combination with HFC or Go and us, not that we were not doing it, but a lot more can happen with, uh, again, alignment, all of it sitting under HFC Bank. So this is just the beginning, Suresh. Um, we are, of course, brainstorming with uh, CEOs of respective companies. That's already uh, more than started happening. Um, so I, I think certainly the intention is very clear that how do we leverage the power of the group uh, to be able to give solutions to the customer. Of course, it will be done respectfully in terms of how, how the customer is looking to be serviced. But there's still a lot that can be done within, within, that, uh, within that arena. So that is on the first question. Uh, if I can move to the second question, Suresh, shall I do that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on uh, LIC, see, the way I see it is that um, just from an India Inc. perspective, the largest financial institution not being listed was uh, prob probably not uh, not really comfortable. It's good that they're listing. Um, it is good that there, there will be a lot more disclosure. Um, ultimately, the shareholders and, and your customers, hopefully there's an overlap, and that's all a good thing, I think. Yes, there might be some short-term turbulence in terms of uh, FII, uh, maybe repositioning, uh, reallocations, and so on. But I, I do believe that that's a short term. Now, uh, from what I read, it is a 21,000 crore outlay as against maybe a 2x of that, again, anecdotally, that we read earlier. So, um, so it's not enormous in the scheme of things, uh, but I think overall the positives are certainly there. 
I think you also talked about uh, growth and so on. For some reason, I think their growth has lagged overall industry, private sector growth. But uh, you know, they they are akin to a um, uh, you know to the large public sector uh, insurer, and I'm sure there's enough. We should focus on expanding the pie rather than just trying to cannibalize from one another. They also operate in a slightly different segment. Their ATS, their ticket size is about a fourth of our ticket size, so slightly different segments of operation. But um, but you know it is uh, nevertheless it's it I think there's enough when you when you triangulate that with life insurance penetration pension as a percentage of GDP and so on I think there's enough for everyone. Any feedback from your agency force on the ground? I mean, from competition standpoint, what they are doing or trying to do? So yeah, so uh, Suresh, I ha I have a monthly um, business review of my zones, okay, zones okay. and regions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you, and that's when my my uh, day long meeting starts off with financial consultants that I meet. Um, mm -hmm. Up to none of my meetings have they ever cribbed. Uh, you know that so and so is happening on the ground. And as you know, this would be this would definitely be on their agenda if 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 it was really consuming them or it was really topical. That's not to say it's not happening. In, I'm sure it's happening in bits and pieces, but it's not it's not consuming their mind on it. Oh, that, that's helpful. Thanks, Lupa. All the best. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of R of Sangai from VT Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, hope all well at your end. Uh, so I have yeah, a couple of well. questions. Uh, ma'am, first question is on the growth part. Like, uh, if we see the last couple of months and when the basis started getting high and even the base might remain high for the same next couple of months, the growth for the industry as a whole has moderated. And even in a uh, rising interest rate environment and a tough macro situation, uh, how do you see the, you know, the narrative changing around some of our savings products or how do people react to, uh, like, historically when we have approached them for these products? Like, how do you see the growth planning out for the industry? Because this is a very big concern among investors right now. So, you know, I, I think that concern, I, I just want to put that concern to perspective because optically it looks like growth has in quarter four for the sector has waned somewhat but if you look at the base effect for us we for example grew 40 percent in quarter four of last year you know we were just coming out of one wave of pandemic and and so on but if i were to look at um you know on a, a cagr basis if you're looking at um uh, the, the growth of 17 percent two year cagr i don't think that's a bad growth against a pandemic uh, yes, industry growth was in uh, was nine percent, but it's not uh, it's not very uh, you know very bad. Also, if you were to look at standalone quarter four, um, the the two year CAGR was twenty three percent for us. Um, for the total industry, it was nineteen percent. So even for the total industry, you know, very close to twenty percent kind of a two year CAGR was not. I, you'll agree that it's not any by no means a tepid growth. But yeah, optically it looks like that because of high growth on a standalone basis. Um, in Q4 of last year. So not really worried. Also, if you, if you triangulate that with uh, GDP, say, you know, 8, 8.5%, one can quibble. Maybe it is 100 basis points lesser or whatever. But it's, I think you'll agree that it's not unlikely to be 4% uh, GDP growth. So at 7, 8, 8.5%, we should grow 2x of that. And that has been the trend uh, all these years. Uh, that's helpful, ma'am. Uh, my second question is on the expense front. Uh, I think one of our other peers also, they also uh, mentioned that they'll be investing a little much more uh, in this year to maybe expand their franchise and all. So uh, is it a trend, like, uh, if we're expending extra, will it affect our VNB margins in the order of our acquisition expenses, you know, increasing? Is there any effect on our margins in the next year? No, so our margins will continue uh, in um, on a standalone basis. It will continue to um, trend upwards, like we have consistently done over the past several years. Uh, um, along with Excite Life uh, as a, a combined uh, margin, what we hope to end is to be flat against our FY22 margins. That will be a good outcome. But on a standalone basis, expansion. So, see, expenses unless you know. Uh, there is something very unusual, like an acquisition that is happening. Um, it will be very much um, part and parcel of what we are doing. 
ओके जस्ट वन लास्ट क्वेश्चन मैम बुक कीपिंग लाइक सिंस बी इंक्रीज द रिटेंशन लास्ट लास्ट क्वार्टर विल इट अफेक्ट द मोर्टैलिटी सेंसिटिविटी गोइंग अहेड एज अ न्यू मिक्स यू नो बिकम द बिगर प्रपोर्शन ऑफ अवर प्रोटेक्शन प्रोडक्ट i'll hand this over to you so the uh, mortality uh, retention um, you know should uh, on the new business uh, should grad should be slightly higher but the ev sensitivity should not really change materially because the retention is applicable only for the new business okay all right uh, that's it for mine and all the best for the coming quarters thank you thank you The next question is from the line of Ravi Naredi from Naredi Investment. Viva, uh, ma'am, uh, fantastic results so far. Growth is there. My point is there. What is the profit from unrealized investment gain as on 31st March 22? So this is nothing but uh, the mark to market of our um, uh, equity. Uh, there is also debt component in that, but simply mark to market. So. as on 31st march whatever is uh, the market rates that that is what uh, and you know the underlying assets under management uh, that will be marked to market and uh, there will be a mirror in the unit link book for example there will be a mirror uh, entry uh, so so if from 100 you go up to say 120 you will have a mo- similar movement in reserves and it will be neutral on profitability over in terms of pack okay and ma'am the can you tell in merged entity of hdfc and hdfc bank how much equity hdfc bank may have, may hold in hdfc life so whatever is currently 47.6 that hdfc is holding that is what will go to hdfc bank and hold the same now they have asked for regulatory approval to take it up to uh, 50% and after merger how the working of hdfc bank will enhance our business growth in compared to hdfc as present yeah so like i mentioned uh, to the earlier question um, there will be a complete alignment because of us subsidiary of hdfc bank uh, and therefore um, also paying a lot of attention on how do we give the customer a one stop shop for all financial services solutions uh, right from perhaps opening up a small savings account when he just or she just starts her uh, job to subsequently giving a mortgage when you get married or want you know there about in terms of lifestyle you you get a, your first options when you're having a kid um health insurance um you know a top up mortgage uh, and there after some fixed deposits uh, retirement solution so everything mutual funds uh, in terms of your surplus that you want to reinvest so you know all of that how does one do it in terms of harnessing the power of hfc group a lot more work is ha- has commenced on that now okay and thank you very much and all the best thank, thank you. you ladies and gentlemen in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference please limit your questions to two per participant should you have a follow up question we would request you to rejoin the question queue The next question is from the line of Deepika Mundra from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good evening, uh, Vipha. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, firstly, just can you walk us through capital requirements for the business going forward? Um, I mean, savings are already at a fairly balanced mix, with protection uh, expected to go up, like you mentioned, and higher retention. How should we view uh, the uh, the solvency requirement for next year, and at what levels would you be comfortable with the solvency? So I'll just start off uh, on this question, Deepika, and I'll hand over to uh, Neeraj and Shreeni. Um, we started off with our solvency of 190% uh, as of 31st of March. Uh, there was a cash payout to Excite Life of, uh, and that is back to 13%, uh, the 726 crores. Um, we ended at 176% as of 31st of March. Um, now we will be raising sub debt. Um, we typically have said that we will hover around the 180% in terms of solvency um so i just wanted to set the context uh, and uh, over to you uh, sneer you want to add 
No, so, Jivika, I think uh, each of these business segments uh, have their own uh, considerations in terms of capital. And uh, as the new business, as the existing business uh, continues to, uh, you know, become uh, larger and larger, that funds the new business uh, growth, as you're aware. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, the self-sufficiency in the model is really uh, working that way. As far as uh, uh, protection business is concerned, uh, yes, it will require uh, uh, more capital compared to some of the savings uh, components. But uh, as, as you're aware, you know, even within savings, uh, Unity product, for example, uh, apart from the solvency capital, there's also a fair bit of uh, gap between the cost of acquisition and uh, the product charge. So that is something which uh, consumes a fair bit of capital as well. And uh, over a period of time, as you're aware, that uh, we would we are expecting to move to a risk based capital approach and uh, that will release significant capital for the industry and uh, that that's something that we need to keep in mind over the next maybe uh, a three year period as well so uh, for us clearly uh, given uh, where we are as a company and the stand that the promoters have taken uh, we do not expect capital to be a constraint for growth uh, whichever way we look at it and on retention, uh, as such, it doesn't really uh, impact so much because uh, the retention really has gone up from 20 lakh to 40 lakh, and that's only for new business going forward. A large part of the solvency ask will really come from the back book, which is still at the retention levels of the past. So that's that's how we need to look at it. And a lot of these things will progress, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, and uh, things will evolve. And uh, uh, for us, uh, uh, the bottom line really is that uh, where there is an opportunity to grow and create value, we will not let capital be a constraint. Okay, that's very clear. Uh, so I, if I may just follow up with one more question, uh, I I'm not sure if I missed it, but what would be the total back book exposure now to uh, guarantee products in total? And again, over here, do you have a level in mind in which you're comfortable with? So, Deepika, uh, if you were to look at our uh, new business product mix uh, across each of the segments, today non par is about 33% uh, of our uh, total new business. And uh, the, the, the way to kind of look at it uh, would be in terms of uh, how much would this really, uh, what would this really mean in terms of uh, either in terms of profitability or in terms of risk or in terms of capital requirements. That's how we look at uh, a managing product mix uh, going forward. Of course, uh, you know, uh, it, it all really depends in terms of how the uh, customer demand is really uh, uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, in each of these areas. So uh, we've uh, launched a, a product uh, in the last uh, couple of quarters, uh, Sanche Fixed Maturity Plan. A uh, large part of that uh, product category, as we discussed last time as well, is coming through in shorter premiums, including single premium. Uh, the risk management on that is uh, reasonably straightforward, as you could expect. And uh, from a uh, from a hedging perspective, also it works uh, fairly well. It helps us actually hedge uh, the business that we've written at the longer end as well. So the capacity to ride non-par is uh, probably only going to increase from here on, given uh, the the way our business has uh, uh, you know uh, created of a diversification and also the external uh, support that is available through uh, you know hedging instruments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Swarna Mukherjee from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, so my first question is related to the PAR products. If you could highlight that, uh, you know, the trend, why the degrowth has been so, is there, is there a conscious effort to manage the product mix? or uh, is there some kind of demand uh, softness that you see at the end or some other category might be cannibalizing on this if you could highlight this. No, no, hi, this is Suresh here. Uh, I mean, just to add, it, it's not really, you know, that we are trying to push one particular product. I think we, like we have mentioned in many other earlier forums, uh, the product mix that we have been looking at is in terms of one, what is the, you know, one, what is good for the customer, which value proposition we want to take across, to the capability of each of our channels to be able to uh, sell that particular product across onto whichever segment we were looking at, and three, the internal drive to make sure that every channel is profitable, as well as make sure that 
that look we have a balanced product mix so you know we really can't look at it in a quarter on quarter basis on an annualized basis if you really look at it we have got a very clear balance and very similar to the kind of product mix that we had over last year Ladies and gentlemen, the line for the management has got disconnected. Request you all to please stay online while we reconnect them. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently waiting. The line for the management has got re reconnected. Thank you, and over to you, sir. I sorry, I don't know where uh, I got disconnected, but just to kind of uh, share with you that look, we are looking at, last year there was a higher growth in par, and that was the base of which had come in. So our uh, whole objective is to make sure that we balance between what the customer needs, what has been the base, and you would find that typically a two-year CAGR of Power has been fairly good. If you were to look at it, it's almost 44 percent. Coming up with innovative products also depends on what new products have been launched. When you know, especially at that time, the new product of Sanjay Power had got launched. We had kind of ensured that everybody on the field, whether it was the SPs of our partner banks, whether it was the FCs, or whether it was our own direct employees, had a much greater focus and attention to launch something in the market, and that led to a huge growth. So you know, these things tend to normalize over a period of time. And now we are focusing, for instance, on Sanjay. MP we are focusing on some of those new products uh, so i won't read too much to say ki look par has come down i think our market share has grown on par we managed to maintain our overall product wise market share on par and we will continue to do that so you know uh, for instance there was a time we slowed down on term in terms of like taking a calibrated approach but now that we believe look things are normalizing we will find us coming back in terms of term growth okay uh that self sir uh, so then uh, in terms of the margin guidance that was mentioned that it will uh, sequentially improve uh then uh, do, do we then uh, are we then looking at individual protection as a incremental lever for margin improvement because higher other i think uh, higher bnb margin kind of products now have quite a sizable base so if we look at the non par savings or the credit protect book Uh, they have grown quite well over the last couple of years, and uh, the base is quite high. So, I mean, uh, if the incremental VNB growth and VNB margin, where do you expect it to come from? Couple of things here. Uh, one is growth itself, because um, as we continue to do well on growth, like we have done, uh, our costs are not going to increase in uh, in the same proportion. Um, so. Uh, that becomes uh, uh, um, an additive point in terms of margin. Second is on non-par non itself. Uh, in the past, they have said that about one third will be around uh, non-par. Now we're getting more nuance. It's also there in our presentation, wherein the new non-par product, the Sanjay FMP, uh, has a shorter tenor, uh, and so we are seeing that in a different light than uh, some of the other longer tenor uh, non-par. And so there really there uh, no constraint in how much we are going to sell that. It is as much as we are able to sell it. Uh, that also will um, will uh, and should lead to mar uh, margin expansion. Credit Protect also is continuing to do well, um, and hopefully uh, all our partners will continue to do well, and we will um, we, we will piggyback on on that growth. and continuing to give um, relevant products there uh, so it's a combination of all of these things uh, wherein uh, we will see that that increase and finally and to your point on retail protection uh, you know for the past couple of years uh, for various reasons especially pandemic reinsurers repricing you know all of that has meant that we have remained more or less flat uh, some quarters we have grown well but largely we have remained flat we are targeting at least a double digit comfortable double digit growth in retail protection and we are reasonably um, uh, optimistic of being able to get there so that also will add to uh, to accretion of margin so all of this will contribute to it so ma'am if i understood you uh, correctly uh, then uh, on the non par bit what you mentioned that you actually now intend to sell slightly higher uh, tenured product for uh, incremental margin Is that a correct understanding? Uh, on the other hand, so lower uh, paying tenure. 
so that hedging becomes easier either single premium or limited uh, premium okay okay all right that's that's very helpful so one uh, uh, quick bookkeeping question if i may ask uh, uh, so if you could give the breakup of the operating variance uh, that is there in the ev walk over around 150 crores and uh, the reason for the negative economic variance Yeah, so the operating variance is broadly uh, two thirds is going to be positive consistency variance, and about one third is expense variance positive. So that's broadly the breakup of uh, the operating variances. Uh, economic variance largely uh, uh, two, two things. Over the year, things have moved in different directions, but overall, uh, from the equity perspective, uh, uh, it has been uh, positive, and uh, largely on the interest rate side, because of the increase of interest rates at the shorter end. Higher higher increase at shorter end, the longer end has resulted in a negative uh, variance. So that imbalance, as such, uh, for the year, it's been fairly flat. Uh, the two have, in some sense, cancelled out each other. Uh, so different quarters have different uh, behaved differently, but for the year broadly, this is really the summary. Got it. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please limit your questions to one per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the question queue. The next question is from the line of Jayant Karoti from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, about the guaranteed uh, the, the longer-term product. There were some news articles about uh, regulators uh, not being comfortable uh, with uh, some of these products. Uh, I think. There's an element of bond forwards in them. So, I mean, what would be your view? And, and I mean, uh, basis that, what would be the mix uh, for our hedging? And then, how much would FRS be contributing to the overall guaranteed, uh, let's say, uh, hedging pool? Uh, so, uh, so, first of all, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we did uh, look at that article and we've, in fact, interacted with uh, all the counterparties that we are, uh, you know, uh, working with. And uh, we believe that it's really unfounded in terms of, uh, you know, what the facts really are, because uh, if you recollect, uh, RBI allowed the structure of FRAs uh, towards the end of 2019. After doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting a lot of comfort around uh, the structure and what it really means, both in terms of risk as well as in terms of uh, uh, what it means for the counterparties, which is basically the banks. And after that, the approval was given for this uh, structure. We don't believe there has been any change in uh, in that regard. In fact, uh, there is a, a sort of further liberalization uh, on, on that front. So we do not believe there is any uh, issue uh, at hand as far as that is concerned. Uh, having said that, from our perspective, uh, as you know that uh, we had started writing on par uh, products uh, prior to RBI allowing us to do uh, forward rate agreements, and we had this internal hedging capacity, which continues to date given the way our CP book has grown. And uh, added to that, there are other instruments as well, and also for new products that we've launched actually help us do this cross hedge internally itself. So our dependence on FRA is uh, probably a lot lower than maybe uh, you know uh, overall uh, at an industry level, and uh, we manage dynamically in terms of how which is, uh, which hedging instrument is going to be more effective from multiple fronts uh, at the back end uh, at a regular uh, you know at regular intervals. So it is an effective instrument. Uh, as as we go forward, uh, we believe that. Uh, with a very forward, uh, you know, thinking regulator, we may in fact get uh, uh, ability to actually borrow directly from the market as well, and uh, that would uh, further, you know, uh, expand the way in which uh, this business can be written. So, uh, uh, in nothing really uh, of any concern as far as uh, the ability to hedge or in terms of, uh, you know, instruments that may be available and options that may be available going forward. So, as we speak, is BAU with banks uh, on an FRA? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and secondly, a uh, couple of quarters back, uh, Mr. Patrasati has spoken about the longevity assumptions on, on the protection side, and, and he mentioned it has come down from around 92 to around 85, 87, if I'm not wrong. If you can update us, where is that number right now, and directionally, where should it stabilize? Hey, these numbers uh, actually are fairly stable. It doesn't change quarter on quarter. So uh, I think whatever numbers uh, that I talked about was based on a um, uh, on a report published by 
the actual profession uh, it gets updated probably once in 3 years 4 years so you know there's no more uh, any more recent update than what i uh, spoke uh, a couple of quarters ago with you and those numbers for us as in uh, i mean i think you spoke about the industry level so for us uh, at gsc life those numbers would be similar yeah yes yeah, very ballpark yeah Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Thank you. The next question is from the line of Hitesh Gulati from Hightong Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I just had a question on economic variance. I uh, just wanted to understand last uh, in the last calls you mentioned that unwind above 8.5 percent we will be showing or uh, above or below 8.5 percent we'll be showing it through investment variance. Is that one of the reasons that economic variance is so low, um, just negative 50 crores, despite rise in yields? Yeah, so uh, so it is a couple of things, right? Uh, the equity movements have cancelled out uh, the slope change uh, on on account of the interest rate, and also yes, I mean, uh, I mean, we can't completely take credit for uh, you know uh, taking the uh, unwind rate at very close to where we are at the end of the year. But yeah, I mean, there was a fair bit of there's a fair bit of thought that goes into what is likely to happen, which goes into the unwind rate that's determined at the beginning of the year. It uh, so happens that the uh, economic variance is uh, basically almost zero because uh, the two movements are actually cancelled out each other. So both of these things are, I guess, in a way playing a role. Uh, the equity and the debt uh, changes uh, kind of cancelling out each other and the expected uh, rate being fairly close to what we are actually realised. Yeah, and you know, just from, do FRAs also have a significant impact on uh, how we uh, book in economic variance? Because some of the peer companies have shown quite a negative impact in economic variance. So just trying to understand that. Uh, no, uh, 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 no, it is uh, that would not really play a role at all. Okay. Uh, yeah, as, I mean, if you are completely hedged, uh, this should not really play a role at all uh, as far as the economic variance is concerned. Economic variance will only be really in terms of the uh, actual movements uh, which are different from what you anticipated, both on the equity side and on the debt side. Yes, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nishin Chavate from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, just one question from my side, and uh, you know what really explains uh, you know margin expansion if we look at uh, the business from a fourth quarter basis, which is either on a quarter on quarter on a year on year basis. So, uh, I if you look at uh, Q1 Q, really, uh, I mean, apart from the. Uh, assumption change on mortality, which we did discuss, large part of it is largely coming through in terms of uh, uh, the product mix uh, shift. We've written more annuities uh, in this period, and uh, the CP business continues to do reasonably well. We managed to reprice a large part of the business uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, and that is something that has uh, uh, helped us as well. And uh, as such, even in terms of uh, the group business composition, uh, margin business is uh, lower this year compared to same time last year. So it's a combination of these uh, two or three uh, uh, facts. Uh, on the non-par side, there has been a slight expansion in the quarter from 32 to 35 percent. So each of these three or four things have uh, played a role in the expansion. And has the duration of policies on the non-par also gone up? Uh, no, not, not okay. So I'm just sorry. Before that, uh, the last bit is also in terms of uh, some sort of leverage that has come through in terms of uh, scale. Uh, uh, so that that also has played a role in uh, the expansion. Uh, so uh, not, not really. Uh, uh, what's happened is that uh, if you recollect, we've launched uh, Sanche fixed maturity plan, which basically is a, a ten-year product, give or take. And uh, a large part of that business is single premium, so it's a one ten. Some of the business is five ten. So that, in fact, in fact, has actually on a on a overall basis would have actually reduced the policy term on non par. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks. My questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dhaval Gada from DSP Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. 
uh yeah uh, thanks for the opportunity so i had two questions uh, first one was on margins uh, so uh, i understand the guidance uh, of uh, maintaining margin on uh, uh, you know most basis just wanted to understand from a medium term perspective uh, uh, we know can the margins move uh, closer to 30% uh, and the context is if you look at the last four years uh, we've seen a large part of the margin increase being driven by uh, product mix change and uh, uh, you know this has come despite uh, sort of negative assumption changes which uh, uh, Su- suresh also alluded earlier so just uh, you know how much more headroom is available to uh, sort of take the margins higher uh, you know closer to 30% in the next 3 to 4 years which effectively means doubling well uh, it should be possible uh, in all things being equal on regulations so it should be possible uh, and that's what we will be working towards it will kind of stabilize around that and this is of course with the caveat that we don't drop a market share um, you know assuming that we hold our number 3 position amongst uh, all the listed companies including LIC um, so without dropping that without dropping a market share but uh, I, yeah we still are running for getting uh, close to 30% and thereafter uh, if there are no further um, regulatory relaxations or enablers then um, having a compounding story of about 20% year on year or close to that in terms of uh, value of new business having said that uh, you know we are hopeful given um, the tone set by the new irdi chairman about a lot of things on technology on ecosystems on use and file a lot of speed to market uh, collaboration uh, perhaps with other regulated entities uh, pension general insurer health insurance uh, and so and many many more i don't personally think that it's going to be status quo it it will be an enabler but i'm not counting that in because i don't know in what in what form or shape um, so all things being equal yes uh, we should be getting towards uh, 30% in the medium term Uh, perfect thanks and just one final thing uh, on the uh, you know uh, sort of capital uh, just again uh, so if you look at the free surplus movement uh, if you could explain that uh, you know in in the last uh, year i mean it's dropped about 350 odd crore so uh, and just uh, within the, uh, and related to this is you know what will trigger an equity raise i mean if you could just help me understand uh, uh, w- what one should look for uh, in terms of your uh, willingness to go towards uh, an equity raise uh, that that would be helpful so while uh, uh, I'll, i'll leave the first part of the question to neeraj on the net worth uh, uh, but uh, we will uh, over a period of time uh, in order whatever needs to be need to support growth and opportunities uh, we will have to have adequate capital uh, and uh, yes uh, we will not rule out equity uh, combination of equity or debt uh, like i had mentioned in my opening remarks uh, go ahead Uh, just to add to that uh, you know we are fairly close to the levels that we want to be like we had mentioned so we are at 176% uh, we would like to be in the 180 190 range given what is expected going forward so the distance between where we are and where we need to be is not very high so uh, you know the the number that we talking about is not going to be very significant that is one uh on the net worth front uh, of course as you are aware uh, the uh, you know the, uh, multiple things have happened uh, on an ongoing basis typically you add uh, your uh, accretion from the back book which is your uh, pat that comes through then you have any sort of capital movements largely in terms of dividend payouts in the beginning of the period after the agm and uh, any sort of uh, capital that comes through in terms of uh, you know the esops that get uh, exercised Uh, apart from that largely the big movements are in terms of any sort of uh, uh, npm movements on the shareholder funds and uh, in our case this time the big movement really was in terms of the cash that went out because of the excite life acquisition so these are the four or five aspects uh, which uh, you know go into how the net worth has or the free surplus has moved uh, in this period thank you mr garam i request that you return to the question queue for follow up questions thank you The next question is from the line of Avinash Singh from MK Global. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. A couple of uh, questions. Uh, first, if you can just help us understand uh, the supply side and demand side realities on the retail protection. So, how do you see uh, sort of uh, growth and margin in uh, this business? That's first. The second, and again, going on that free surplus part. if i recall your uh, sort of a uh, required capital level when you you set in your ev is around 180% uh, so i mean uh, just if you help me at 176% uh, sort of uh, how is uh, sort of a free surplus coming in yeah mr kushal 
So, Avinash, on your first point, uh, just to understand, you're saying uh, margins on health, is it? No, no. I was saying that uh, considering the supply side and demand side uh, changes that have happened over the years, how do you see retail protection shaping out in FY23, both from the growth and margin perspective, retail protection? Understand. So um, we have you know, flat uh, so far because of, uh, like you mentioned, pandemic and reinsurer and pricing and all that. We are fairly um, uh, optimistic of being able to grow double digit. Uh, and, uh, you know, as against last year, industry was also did not grow. We also were flattish. Uh, from HTC Life's point of view, um, while following and continuing to follow a risk calibrated approach, we ho we are hoping to grow double digits on individual protection. Um, and this is without necessarily keep retaining a lot more on our books um, and so on. We we have said that we will retain about 40 lakhs on our books. We'll continue with that. Uh, but uh, nuanced approach, we, we hope to grow. That is number one. Uh, credit protect should continue to grow well. We grew about 55%. Uh, we, we hope to uh, continuing to see that traction. We've also repriced quite a few relationships in light of uh, pandemic. That's an ongoing exercise and part and parcel of uh, uh, of how get covering mortality risk. Both these put together, that we should grow. We have grown about 26%, uh, but we uh, on an overall protection basis. But we we are uh, we remain uh, fairly optimistic to, of our ability to continue to grow. And any price changes in retail protection you are taking in FY23 or not? Uh, nothing that is on the cards right now. Okay. And my question on the free surplus. Uh, yes, Avinash, on the free surplus, uh, if I understood you, uh, you're referring to the level of, uh, you know, the solvency. So, as you're aware, uh, regulatory solvency 150%. For the purpose of EV, we basically take 170%. So, right now, we have something in uh, okay. yeah, in excess of that. So, that's that. Yeah, yeah, it's very clear. That I was confused with 170-180. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, that's the thing. Is that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Just just uh, laboring on retail protection. I think in opening remarks, Viva, you mentioned about uh, video uh, uh, checks and stuff, right? Uh, you're connecting to the customer mobile. If you can elaborate how that can, and I'm just tying it to your original comment that while applications come through, we are still not able to process. So where is that number? I recollect some quarters back was like 60%. So just help us understand how debottlenecking some of your own processes could help you improve growth, specifically related to retail protection, say. Right. Um, so here, one is that... Um, Looking at it out of every hundred, like we mentioned in the past, we're converting about 61. So we are taking reasonably um, realistic targets to say instead of 61, even if I convert it to 70 or 75, that will get me to that answer. Um, so, uh, so that's what we are looking at: is that we are trying to solve for. Um, uh, the entire process. So we've launched um, uh, MediEasy. This you'll find on slide 21 of our investors' uh, uh, PPT. Uh, what this does is that it walks our frontline salesperson um, and uh, step by step. Because what what we did find is that uh, the rules keep changing because of pandemic, because of uh, reinsurer, because of what we ourselves are looking at in terms of addressing new and emerging risks and so on for all the right reasons. However, the guy on the field is very confused. There is attrition, whether we like it or not. There is a people movement, and then you know there's a lot of back and forth, and the customer. Uh, gives up or uh, the frontline salesperson gives up or a combination of uh, these aspects. So uh, so that, so that, how can we have this iteration wherein uh, the first step is to say, um, okay, we need this document. Okay, if you don't have this document or rather if the customer doesn't have this document, then uh, we have a call center which has an assisted uh, call center with chartered accountants to say, okay, instead of this, especially for the non-salary, this, this should be fine or this proxy can be fine and so on. So, you because the guy is sitting with the customer and or sitting virtually with the customer and he's able to get that rather than it coming back to central operations going back and forth and and so on similarly um, looking at what other data points uh, were resulting in us in that same 100 minus 61 
uh, why is why has there been a drop off and and uh, is there some other ways of getting to the same answer uh, for example today we don't have a deduping between our credit life database and our individual database now with the use of uh, technology if we can try and see personas uh, of um of you know, what is behind this person in terms of both financial risk as well as medical risk um that again could help us address some of that drop off that we are seeing currently um similarly with reinsurers we are finding that reinsurers uh, and you know we've been partnering with reinsurers and that has been well appreciated in fact reinsurers have come back to us to say that we are erring a little bit on the side of caution uh, and they are they obviously fairly pleased about that and and willing to look at certain personas if you also look at meditech for example a whole host of things again on slide 21 on the bottom right hand side how do we get a proxy for diabetes how do we get a proxy for um, for uh, any uh, heart related illness without that individual going in for a um, medical which uh, obviously under um given the pandemic um, he or she is hesitant uh, to do that and we understand that so um so for us to be again able to to triangulate triangulate that with age with with uh, various other data points and his or her uh, reticence to go in to get a medical uh, being able to use meditech to be able to solve that another point and we've just gone live on this wherein uh, underwriting engine which although we have only right now launched for savings but that is now that has an error rate of 0.001% now and it's a ml so it's a machine learning tool which is getting even better as we speak so uh, we have rolled that out where in human underwriters uh, have been uh, substituted so that the customer can be given a straight through processing can be given much better experience and so on now uh, the next phase is to start taking baby steps to look at our term as well what this will do is that again how do we reduce the the drop off rate yes we need to in increase the funnel also admittedly but that is one part of it we are saying that people have come in out of my example of 100 people have paid money filled in the proposal and we are not able to issue them with a the policy and we return their money so let us focus on the drop off first and that's what we'll be giving uh, and have been giving disproportionate management bandwidth to reducing drop off thanks uh, thanks so much ruban all the best oh, thank you thank you the next question is from the line of sanket goda from spark capital advisors please go ahead yeah uh, thank you thank you for the opportunity uh, so so the simple question what i have is that means uh, you gave the means uh, uh, just i wanted to understand how much fmp contributes to the total individual apv means in total non par is 33 percentage so 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 and 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 and, and just wanted to understand means if, if the incremental focus is on this particular product from risk management point of view how much uh, this 33 contribution of non par can potentially go to say 40 45 kind of a number any any number you have in your mind which which could be the margin by are going ahead so that's that's the first question what i had and and the second question can i take question, the first question first uh, sanket and then you can move on to the second question sure 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 no. yeah so uh, the, the on the first one uh, what you're saying is that long tenured uh, uh, policies uh, that we sell we will have a overall cap which we have had but yeah. on shorter tenure we have no cap So, so basically, you mean to say that if 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 there is a decent demand for single premium FMP plan, then then you can even take the total non-par mix or even beyond forty, fifty kind of a number. If 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 yeah, hypothetically, yes, yes, hypothetically. Yes. Okay. And, and and the margin of uh, single premium FMP will be better than the company average. It will. If it will definitely be better than some of the other segments like par and uh, UL, obviously. so there will be a substitution could be a substitution for that and thereby taking it up uh, because of that substitution got it got it perfect and and uh, the, the second thing was that um, means uh, just, just from the hdfc bank mergers perspective so 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 we we make an advertisement spend in hdfc bank as a channel of around 800 crores which we did in 9 months fy22 uh, so so just wondering how this will play out if 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 uh, if it becomes a direct bb of hdfc bank uh, that that given it's a direct subsidiary now then 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 do we expect these advertisement spends coming off and if it happens will this be a very big lever for 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 margin expansion uh, how do we read this uh, to play out 
little bit premature sanket because uh, it just been announced uh, i i think over a period of time we will work very closely with hsc bank folks to see how uh, as a parent subsidiary we can uh, you know the dynamic obviously will change um, but little bit early in the day now um, the advertisement is really uh, what happens is there is multi tie uh, and the reason for the advertising uh, budget is that when people walk into the 6000 branches Uh, and engage with them virtually and so on uh, we need to be out there we need to be able to say you know this is sanchar fm this is our um, retirement new retirement plan and so on and that visibility has to be there and that's why the the uh, advertising now how things will change down the line we'll have to see uh, there will always be some advertising to uh, because uh, the bank has said there will be multi tie and multi tie we believe is good for the customer yes there could be um how much of multi tie is a different for some level of multi tie wherein you're giving customer the um, uh, you know the, the choice to um, to buy various products and i also personally believe that most banks eventually will open up to multi tie um and so some level of this will be there we'll have to see in terms of um, how things pan up uh, however what is important is how do we expand the pie rather than just you know which costs might not be there and Uh, you know the, those sort of things the focus will be on how do we cross sell because that just hasn't been done in a systematic manner as of today and like i mentioned with one of the earlier call, callers it has been in somewhat in a stand alone company view rather than a financial conglomerate and that lens will change we will look at our balanced product mix we will look at um, how can we uh, like i mentioned earlier uh, upsell relevant uh, to the customer's needs and, uh, and that itself will give us a kind of uplift got it got it uh, this uh, can you tell me the uh, current fmp contribution to the total ep if if you if you are okay to uh, disclose that number exact number the value on it really makes sense not on eps also uh, uh, sanket this has been launched a few months back so since launch it's about uh, 15% of the business thank you mr kodam may we request that you return to the question key for follow up questions thank you the next question is from the line of abhishek saraf from jeffries please go ahead Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the opportunity. I just had few quick questions pertaining to expired life. So just quick one. So if you can just give me some num- number on the, what could be the VNB margin post OR. If uh, uh, I, I, if I, I joined late, probably I might have missed that. If you mentioned. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, if you can give some color on the cost savings that we are uh, doing. Uh, uh, so. if any number around the uh, rationalization of branches or uh, other uh, numbers that you can share where you are able to save cost and then i have one follow up question after this no hi i will uh, uh, you know uh, on the margins that you do if we are on the low we are on the low for run uh we do believe that uh, we should be able to scale this up in the natural course of business once it merges with us and over a certain 36 to 48 month period we should be able to and maybe even lesser than that we should be able to bring it close to our kind of margins so that should not really be a problem on the uh, other piece in terms of how the integration and how we are trying to uh, get value capture and synergy let me let me tell you that look there are some 23 work streams working on every aspect of the business to in both the teams uh, and we are looking at the uh, best practices across both the companies there is a clear focus in terms of where we will be able to get wider distribution focus we are looking at the entire product portfolio between what excite has and what we have got also in terms of how we will be able to take some of our technology and digital tools across to their set of so branch rationalization is one of the piece obviously there are a few branches which we we'll look at which are close to each other we are open to look at which of the excite branches are probably better fit and better catchments and we'll probably be able to merge so on both sides we are looking at finally as a merged entity which are the best resources we do believe that we'll get scale for the uh, entity and we'll be able to expand into markets in many forums was that looking excite a lot of the business that do is in south in so we do believe that some of that uh, we will be able to you know scale up we will be able to uh, expand our geographic presence and similarly in based on their agency model we will be able to expand it to other parts of the country sure thanks for that so any come means uh, did we do any branch rationalization in the last 3 months as a
as of now. Uh, but we do believe we understand which are the markets that we are able to cater to. And uh, our objective, like has been clearly mentioned, is to make sure that we continue to get the upside from the excite merger over uh, you know, the short to midterm and then look at how synergistically we can grow as a merged entity. Thank you, Mr. Saraf. May we request that you return to the question queue for, for follow-up questions. The next question is from the line of Nidesh Chen from Investec. Please go ahead. Uh, 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 thanks for the opportunity. So two questions. First on peer protection, uh, are we sensing any change in stance on the reinsurers as of now? Are they becoming uh, uh, more open to uh, doing business the way they were doing pre-COVID or uh, still they remain as strict as uh, what we have seen last year? So in this case, it's, uh, I think, a little bit too early. Uh, my personal sense is down the line, I don't know what time frame, I think, uh, depending on wave four and and so on, till that uh, is out of the way, I think there will be some level of uh, concern in their minds. Uh, I don't see that happening in, immediately now. But over a period of time, yes, uh, the high alert uh, situation that we have been in, that should ease off a little bit, but still some way away. Sure. So, uh, uh, what was the conversion rate before COVID, uh, the 60% conversion rate that we have today? What was that uh, before COVID? We used to convert uh, maybe around, out of 100, convert at least 75. Sure. And sec lastly, on non-par product, uh, in a rising rate environment, uh, so in, in last three years, the interest rates have been declining and uh, demand for non-par product was very, very strong. Uh, probably the alternative savings instruments have seen significant decline in the yields that they were offering. But in a rising interest rate environment, how do we see uh, demand for the non-power product? Uh, and uh, since we are hedging the bulk of the non-power internally, does it uh, disadvantage us in any way versus FRA hedging, where uh, our peers may be able to offer better IRRs than us? Uh, these are the two questions on non-power. Uh, so, in this, as far as demand is concerned, uh, we've seen uh, interest rates only increase in this year, right? And both at the shorter end as well as the longer end. While uh, while that has happened, uh, the business demand continues. Uh, even as we speak, uh, the demand far exceeds what we are uh, writing as a company as far as this product line is concerned. So, uh, the key really is uh, not absolute rates. It's a relative proposition to what other instruments are available. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you were to compare it to, uh, you know, shorter term instrument, typically the uh, returns on that are very, very different from what we are able to offer because uh, a large part of the product is in the, you know, uh, at the longer end. Even in uh, Sanjay fixed maturity plan, uh, the term is 10 years. So that is very different from a typical uh, short term uh, fixed income instrument that uh, people buy. So relative to what is available in the market, it continues to be attractive, whichever way the interest rate, uh, that is one. And second, also the, the tax advantage on top of that is something that uh, definitely is uh, helpful. Uh, as far as hedging is concerned, uh, we are fairly, uh, we monitor this fairly closely and it is uh, fairly dynamic. Uh, we are uh, fortunate to have this internal capacity, which, which we use uh, depending on how the external uh, environment is as well. We don't want to be overly dependent on any one instrument, uh, whether it's an external or uh, uh, internal capacity. So that's the reason why it's a multi-pronged, uh, you know, hedging strategy at the back end. As far as uh, FRAs are concerned and relative disadvantage to anybody else, I don't believe so. Because uh, uh, so far, uh, there is uh, you know, only a yield pickup that we get on account of uh, forward rate agreements because of the way the, uh, the term structure is in terms of the interest rates. If that changes, then uh, that will again uh, you know, be clearly ap applicable to everybody. So it's not that the terms that we get are any different from anyone else. And uh, if there is any advantage to be had out of writing more or uh, hedging more through FRAs, we would we would take that call without being excessively dependent on that category. Sure, uh, understood. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Mayank Gulgulia from SUD Life. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. I have a question related to sensitivity analysis. So Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Is it better now? Yeah, it is. 
Okay. So I have a question related to sensitivity analysis. So basically impact of equity market return on EV. So uh, equity market downward movement of 10% would have 1.4% negative impact on EV. So this 10% is uh, overall return on equity portfolio. Or this 10% is over and above like we might have assumed some return from equity. So it is over and above that. It's uh, it's basically uh, it's a difference between what is expected and what is actually so. For example, any if you take any of the sensitivities, you have a base which is the expectation. So in persistency, mortality, or uh, equity earn, you'll have a base. Anything over and above that is uh, what is captured in the sensitivity. So if your expected return is say 10 percent, and 10 percent delta from that means 11 percent or 9 percent return. And the impact of that is what is captured in the sensitivities. Okay. So uh, uh, this 10 percent is of uh, return expected. So not 10 percent plus or minus 10 percent. This is 10 percent of 10 percent. What? You want to say that? Yeah. Just to clarify, the equity sensitivity implies that the equity values fall on the date of the catalyst of the EV. If the equity values fall by 10 percent. What would be the impact on EV? What is captured in the sensitivity? Okay. Let's say, uh, as you, uh, like, just to clarify further, the uh, assumption is 10 percent. So, if equity market rise by uh, 15 percent next year, so uh, can we say like uh, 5 percent extra return? So, delta uh, of 1.4 percent, we can divide by 2 and broadly ballpark number 0.7 percent positive uh, impact on EV. Is that the uh, right way to look at? So this is instantaneous return. So whatever the valuation you take or whatever the assets were, if they were to fall instantaneously by 10% on that very day, what is the movement in the EV is what this is. Okay. Okay. Got it. And uh, like the next question is, what is the impact of like uh, lower in uh, reinsurance on our uh, protection business? So what kind of uh, margin impact is there on uh, uh, retail protection? Impact? Sorry, didn't follow your question. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so uh, like, uh, 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 like of lower reinsurance on retail protection, so uh, how it is impacting our margins on standalone retail protection business? So there, there is there is no impact really. Uh, uh, as you know, the reinsurance cost is basically one of the components of the overall uh, cost and the risk charge. And we would, uh, if we retain on our books, we will obviously need to capture that risk charge ourselves in addition to everything else. And the same would hold for the reinsurers. And uh, the, there isn't much of a gap between uh, uh, what the reinsurers are charging today versus what our assessment of the risk charge would be. That would have been def uh, that would have been uh, the delta between that would have been higher before the reinsurers increase their prices. And we also increased it thereby nullifying some of the impact. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishi Junjunwala from IIFL. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just quickly, uh, you know, on the agency workforce, right, so with XI Life uh, uh, getting integrated, can you give some sense in terms of, you know, what are our targets in terms of total agency uh, strength that we want to maintain, uh, what kind of uh, increase we are looking at, and also uh, just a sense in terms of what are, you know, what is the proportion of active agents and what kind of retention rates have been witnessed since uh, the integration. Sorry, I couldn't catch your uh, second question. I'll ask you to repeat it. But on your first question, in terms of the uh, agency uh, business and what kind of growth we are looking at, exactly like, um, uh, very clearly, you know, they have had a very strong growth. But just has been a little different earlier. We had a fairly decent growth in line and slightly higher than the industry. Uh, we do believe that given the brand that they will now benefit of HCC Life along with the product as well as our ability to invest in branches, infrastructure, and many other resources which will be available, we should be able to get a much higher throughput in terms of uh, actually recruiting financial consultants, in terms of activating more consultants, as well as recruiting the ticket size of the kind of products that we're able to sell through HCC Life. 
in our initial interaction with a lot of the financial consultants advisors at uh, Excite Life, we have found that look, they are eagerly looking forward to the kind of products that HGC Life is the table. So we are fairly optimistic in terms of growth that they will be able to continue in terms of what they have been able to build. They have a very strong franchise. They have a fair amount of uh, financial consultants leaders who've been there with them for a fairly long period of time. Uh, we do believe that uh, if uh, our agency uh, business were to grow at a certain pace, the combined entity of the agency business of what Excite Financial Consultants comes in should be able to do that and maybe a little bit higher. So that should not be really a problem. Uh, there, there is actually, if you ask me, not just the synergy that we see only in the agency business. I think we are enthusiastic about the growth in all the channels of uh, Excite Life. We do believe that the cooperative bank, as well as some of the broking relationships that they have got, uh, are fairly incremental and complementary to our business growth. So we do believe that we should be able to and grow that. Uh, also, a fairly large um, uh, customer base on which they have, uh, uh, you know, cross-sell and upsell on their direct uh, business. Uh, we believe that we will be able to, with our analytic skills, with our uh, SMPs, along with what they bring in terms of their campaigns, it will be incremental for us to be able to grow that line of business also. So, ac actually, across the direct business, broken business, bank assurance of those much smaller than us on bank assurance and on the agency business, we shouldn't see any slow down and which is one of the primary reasons why we said we will work we will look at excite in, in terms of the company which will come in and act complementary to us sorry on the second question the uh, sound was not very clear so i couldn't yeah really yeah i'll repeat sir thank you so basically the question was uh, you know how many active agents now we have and what kind of retention rates have we seen at uh, excite life so they they have around 40000 fcs which are there right now and uh, which, which is something that, and they have a fairly active uh, uh, base which is there. So uh, we, we do believe that we will be able to uh, actually further activate. Their activation is in line with actually the industry activation. So it is not that they're off in terms of the number of agents which are active. We haven't lost any major. In fact, if you have looked at the quarter four numbers, they have been absolutely on target in terms of what the agency team has been delivered, delivering. So even there, we believe that if we are able to look at the number of new uh, uh, financial consultants and agents that they will be able to recruit, that will be in line. And in fact, they have been constrained on their growth because of their capital and many other uh, you know, um, uh, thresholds which they've not been able to invest in their business. I think a lot of those hindrances will go away once they become part of the HDFC group. So they All right, thank and, you. And, uh, and they, they've actually shown almost a 22% growth uh, uh, last year, if you were to look at them at overall as uh, excited. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take last two questions. The next question is from the line of Roshan Shutke from ICICI Prudential Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Thanks. My questions have been answered. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanket Goda from Spark Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, last last one from my side. We just wanted to understand our FRA exposure, which is one which was 137 rupees at the end of FI21. Uh, uh, what is the current exposure we have at at the end of FI22? And and uh, uh, given given the current solvency calculation regime, uh, if if uh, yield curve becomes steeper, uh, sorry, flatter compared to what it was, then most of the derivative contracts might go out of money, notional loss. So, likely impact of it uh, on it on the solvency if if it plays out. Yeah, I think it's, uh, the the price exposure is close to about uh, eighteen nineteen thousand. I think it will be there in the annual report in any case. But uh, uh, to your second point in terms of the uh, the impact of the flattening curve, uh, there are two things here. One is uh, as of now. Uh, you know, the whole flattening thing is something which is a little maybe overplayed. I think uh, if you look at uh, the way the interest rates have moved, they've not moved only at the shorter end, they've moved at the longer end as well. So the curve continues to be fairly steep uh, even today. Having said that, if there is further flattening that happens, uh, what will happen to start with is that uh, the spreads uh, that uh, that are there currently available uh, will probably shrink further as they have uh, since the inception of FRAs. 
and uh, when the yield curve starts getting inverted is that's when you're talking about the situation that uh, you just uh, spoke about now uh, if that were to happen uh, we would do a couple of things one uh, as of now uh, at, at any, any point in time if you have a fairly significant equity portfolio there are equity fpc gains that are sitting in your books for which you don't take solvency credit because of the regulations a lot of that is used to actually offset any sort of uh, impact of uh, interest rates uh, movement in the you know, uh, wrong direction from an FRA perspective. So that uh, usually covers for uh, most scenarios as far as, uh, you know, impact on solvency is concerned. And uh, beyond FRAs, I mean, we kept reiterating, we do not want to be wholly dependent on forward rate agreements either, given, uh, you know, our uh, risk management strategy. So that is also something that, you know, allows us to uh, mitigate the impact of any of these uh, situations that could happen. Over a period of time, we are expecting, uh, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, liberalization in the regulatory framework, both in terms of uh, the way solvency is calculated, which currently uh, penalizes you for being economically hedged, but on the uh, accounting side, you end up uh, creating that solvency impact. Over time, we expect that to kind of, uh, you know, uh, go away, with RBC coming in for all, for, for sure. And also in terms of uh, if we allow to borrow directly, then you, you know, get rid of this problem altogether. So if you take a two to three year view, then a lot of these developments will happen, which will actually, you know, help us, uh, you know, tide over uh, any of these uh, situations that you're talking about. Got it. So the equivalent RBC solvency for 176 currently calculated would be how much if, if you have internally done the math? So we have Sanket, it will be fairly significant. I mean, not really, you know, sharing uh, uh, numbers, but I mean, okay, yeah, okay. it will be fairly significant, uh, Sanket. Okay, perfect. Uh, that's it for my side. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Anand Bhavnani from White Oak Capital. Please go ahead. And thank you for the opportunity. Just a quick clarification on Excite Life. Uh, you made a comment that due to the solvency, they probably had some growth constraint. In the PPT, there, I see that the solvency is 217, which is higher than us. So why would that be? A reason for any growth challenges in Excel? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think look, the constraints on their end have been more in terms of the expense of management, you know, because of which they, which goes away once they come in with us. So, uh, you know, uh, if no, once we, we merge with us in terms of their ability to be able to invest further in agency on growth, that is where they have been uh, struggling. So I, I think that is one part which we will be able to solve with this merger and their agency business will be able to grow and not not on solvency. Okay. Okay. And for our solvency, uh, our current preferred route of, you know, tier two uh, raising debt, which helped uh, improvement by 6%, do we anticipate uh, that to be the primary uh, source rather than any equity raise? No, uh, it's a combination of both. Like I mentioned in my earlier comments, it will be uh, both. Uh, right now, we are raising a Tier 2, um, but uh, over a period of time, we'll assess the need for uh, capital, uh, and um, we will. Ha we it is always possible that we might raise a small amount of equity at that point in time. Okay. Any particular variables you kind of use to decide which? Uh, tool to use, which method uh, to use for buttressing solvency? See, uh, uh, with solvency, there is an overall cap uh, based on regulatory uh, formula. Um, so uh, what we're doing right now, we raised 600 earlier, we are, we are raising further now. Um, you know, as our back book increases, we will be able to um, raise more. We will look at overall the weighted uh, average cost of capital uh, to see you know what works for us uh, and then you know a the vac as well as um, how much do we need um, how soon do we need so few factors like take a call down the line yeah thank you and all the best thank, thank you. you as there are no further questions i would now like to hand the conference over to Ms. Viva padalkar for closing comments thank you faizan we would like to thank all of you for participating in our results call. Further details can be found in our investor presentation on both our book as well as that of the exchanges. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of HDFC Life Insurance, that concludes this conference call. 
Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.